This episode of the Switchcast was produced by Edward Rhodes. Edward went over to patreon.com slash the Switchcast and pledged enough support to become our first Switch King. If you'd like to do the same, go over to our Patreon page and uh, you can join in the fun as well. Hi everybody, I'm KC. And I'm JV. And this is the Switchcast, the podcast for the Switch enthusiast. And it is a very big episode today, actually, because this is another special episode, part two, if you will, of our uh, weekend of mayhem. (laughs) Exactly. We got so much going on this past weekend, and we could not fit everything we wanted to cover on one episode. So here we are, making a new one, part two. Yeah, basically. And uh, this time we're covering the Nintendo Treehouse slash hands-on Switch event, in which one of the two people you're listening to right now got to touch a Nintendo Switch. Wow, I'm so envious of you right now, Casey. I, you have no idea how many lengths I would go just to touch the texture of a Switch <laughs> Joy-Con right now. It was it was quite a few lengths I had to go through as well. See, um, I was stupid enough to believe the invitation when it said that they would not allow people to start lining up until 7 uh, a.m., and that was in the city, and unlike the previous event, it was not a warm night. It was quite a cold morning, and uh, I had numb hands as I was tweeting away online, but I got there at 7, and I was already, like, number 300 on the line. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> that's kind of insane, considering last time you had a 50, 58 degrees, and that was your warm temperature. That was warm, and uh, this was definitely, like... I don't know, I'd say 30s, not like the coldest in the world, but still enough to make my hands super numb when I was like typing. That's about near death to me, so (laughs) the world is practically an ice age here in Texas for me there. Okay, well, then you say you definitely don't want to come to a Switch event here, but uh, you could probably still check out what cities they're going to be taking it on the road with if you go to the uh, Nintendo Switch homepage. Oh yeah, I'm definitely excited. There's a... Luckily, there are upcoming events listed on the website for other uh, Nintendo Switch previews. Yes. And one of them happens to be PAX South. Oh, that's right. Down here in Texas, San Antonio. Very cool. So, yeah, you're you're, you're, you're almost there then. You're going to get your hands on it soon. Yeah. Uh, It is literally nine days from this recording day that I will get to touch a Nintendo Switch. And PAX South is fun, too, you know. But yeah, no, dude, that's going to be pretty awesome. You're going to get your hands on and then we can compare notes uh, and you won't have to wait online probably the same way outside. Um, and, but I'll tell you some of the other hardcore, I, I got to meet uh, a bunch of actually some of our Switch cats over there. Nice. Yeah, I heard, I heard there were a few meetups there where you gathered a bunch of friends to, to check it out. Well, I ran into a Team Alpha Go. I mean, Team Atlas Go. Yes, team. sorry, Team Atlas Go. Thank you. Uh, he actually went and got a room in that hotel with his brother, and they came to New York just to be on that line and get there as, as soon as he could. So he just kind of took the elevator down. Said he got. I think he got online around 6 o'clock, and there were already other people there. Um, the earliest of the people I met started uh just kind of like haunting around the block until the guards just got tired of char- chasing people away and uh they started lining up at 5 30. Uh, honestly that's that's relatively reasonable 5 30 that's an hour and 30 waits not too bad no 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 that's not the hour and a half see that's just when the line was supposed to start around oh gotcha gotcha that's the line the doors to the event opened at 10 but all right so they again they had a little bit they had a pretty good logistics to it around nine o'clock they gave out wristbands the first 250 people on the line got to go in the first session it was a 90 minute session and then i was in the second group that was around 12 30 and uh so i i had to wait till 12 30 but at, once i got my wristband i actually just went off i went to my office which wasn't too far from there and i just kind of hung out there and uh Warmed up, recharged my phone, and then came back just in time for the uh, the second session. Yeah, that that doesn't sound too bad either. Honestly, if 
If I had lived closer to New York, maybe in the East Coast somewhere, I probably would have made the trek to to try it out. It was fun. I really did have a fun time. Again, it's just it was just another great chance to meet other Switch fanatics and a yeah. bunch of uh, listeners. That was really cool too. Yeah, you put up a lot of pictures on Twitter and Facebook, and it it looked like you guys are really uh, really friends. There was a lot of camaraderie there. Yeah. It seemed. And that- and even one of our friends uh, was on. It was running uh, one of the stations in there, and uh, I was hoping to have Old Miz on the show, but she'll be on in the future. She just she's not allowed to talk about the Switch until it actually is released. Though I I have to ask, mm-hmm. uh, you said you did run into a bunch of our uh, you know Switch cats. Mm-hmm. Did you see anyone that happened to have contributed to our Patreon? Now, I think Team Atlas is probably the, uh, the, the most serious listener that uh, I ran into there. So, yeah, none of the Patreon backers yet. But that is that, 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 that does remind me, though, everybody, yes, with the Patreon is still running. If you haven't checked it out yet, I would like to meet more of you people from there. Uh, I would like to say the next time I run into a bunch of Switch Cats that uh, a lot of them were backers. So if you go down to patreon.com slash the Switch Cast... We have actually a bunch of, we've established the rewards that we're going to be giving out now for the different levels, yes? Right, yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, I think you guys would really enjoy what we're giving out to our backers. Yeah, so we got, we were planning some uh, t shirts for certain level of backers from everyone who's a Switch Knight and up, I think. Oh, no, Switch sorry. King. Switch King and up. So that's what, ha- that was a $20 backer. Yes. So, so far, uh, the best rewards are for the Switch Kings. Uh, which is a nice SwitchCast t-shirt. And the Switch Kaisers get a really cool special item, too. Yeah, we're going to be making some custom uh, USB drives with the SwitchCast logo. And we're going to stock them up with all the episodes that we've made. Uh, that'll obviously have to wait until we actually have enough episodes to fill it. But we're, we're working on that pretty fast. So Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's going to be a standard USB. So if for whatever reason you don't want our episodes on there... Just yeah. delete them and yeah. use the full space <laughs> for whatever you want. But honestly, we're going to be getting there very fast because the listenership is exploding since this weekend. Right. I, I remember uh, earlier this week, you tweeted out a, a post congratulating us for 10K downloads total. Yes, right. <laughs> and then and then once we released the previous episode, it went insane. We got 10K per episode. For that, yeah, that last episode was 10,000 listeners by itself, just doubled our listeners right there. Yeah, and our ep- our backlog of episodes are getting a huge amount of listens as well. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's it's pretty impressive how large we've gotten so far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, just to put some icing on the cake, we're going to really drive home the point and uh, get our names out there because we were... And this is the first time I'm announcing it to any a, anywhere. Our panel was approved for PAX East, baby. That's right. We're going to be part of a panel at PAX East. Now, this isn't guaranteed that I will be there, but at least 100% Casey's going to try to make it for that panel. Yes, yes. I am gonna, I'll am gonna. i drive there if I have to, but I, I'm definitely going to be there. Um, and it's a panel on podcasting and how to go from, you know, how to start your own and go from beginning to a professional podcast and uh I, you know i've done a bunch but some of the other guys that are on this uh, panel are pretty uh pretty prolific podcasters as well so uh there's going to be others to learn from that know a lot more than me even so right but- it's 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 not just going to be kc or kc and i it's uh yeah it's going to be a bunch of people you can really learn from if you want to produce content yourself this is a panel that you should check out at pax east yeah, and I didn't even think I was going to go to PAX East. I'd pretty much given up on it. This panel was my last chance to get a ticket, and huzzah, I got it. And so, again, and that's also run by – that was organized by that same Miz girl that was running the event at the Switch thing. So uh, thank you very much, Ms. Silva, for uh, s- organizing just so much awesomeness. I got to just yeah. give you a shout-out. Are there the people who are at the, the Poke Problems podcast that uh, I was on a couple of times? Yeah, it's very good, good stuff. Looking forward to that for sure. All right. I think we should uh, jump right off of this ledge and into the treehouse. <laughs> this, I was scared you were going to jump us off a cliff or something. So, But no, a treehouse is a lot more fun. Into a treehouse. We're jumping off a cliff into a treehouse. 
Yeah. Okay, hopefully not from too big a distance, but let's do it. <laughs> okay. All right, so we uh, why don't we start off here with the general impressions, the most important thing, I actually getting my hands on the Nintendo Switch, feeling it, knowing what it weighs, you know, what it, what, what it, how it handles and stuff like that. So let me just start off with that right off the bat here, okay? Oh, yeah. It's, it's definitely interesting because uh, we have two separate perspectives here. One mm-hmm. from someone who viewed it from a distance from the stream, and you, Casey, who <laughs> yes. actually experienced it firsthand. So it's going to be really interesting to see what our perspectives are coming from you know different distances of of yeah. experience. So I um, I go into the event, and the very first thing I did was uh, thanks to a tip from another one of our listeners. Though he told me uh, he was there the day before. And um, I, r- I right away signed up for the Zelda demo because those were 20 minute long demos. Only so many people, they, they you know had time to only show it to so many people. So I got on the list and I was like, all right, I'm in the second group going to that too. All right, so I have 20 minutes to kill. And I just wanted to play around with the Switch itself. I didn't want a game that I'd have to like, um, you know, I wanted to just spend time. And it, so I picked a game to play that wasn't going to have too many people online. So I just went for the Disgaea 5 booth just to sit down and chill out with the system. That's actually not the worst idea, though, because Disgaea 5 has come out in other consoles. Mm -hmm. So it's a good starting point to, you know, compare how the Switch feels compared to to the PS3. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I'm very familiar with the Disgaea games. And so, all right, so I get my hands... On the switch right away, they give they give me the uh, Joy-Con connected, and it's on the TV there. And okay, so first off, I, I it felt like just a regular controller. When I was holding the Joy Cons, I really can't say that it felt like it, it didn't feel weird. It didn't feel like I was holding some sort of like the Batarang from N sixty four or anything like that. It just felt like a natural controller, right? Right. Which, which and that's just, definitely yeah, that's definitely interesting to me because. Uh, you know, the Wii U, the gamepad didn't really feel standard. It felt a little uncomfortable and took some time to get used to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's- obviously the original Wii had a remote nunchuck set up, and that was weird in its own. Yeah. So the fact that the Joy-Con and the Joy-Con grips feel natural is, is nice. It's a, it's, it's a nice uh, return to form. Yeah, the Joy-Con grip, right? That's what they call that when you have it like that. And that, that, honestly, yeah. it's, it's, it's perfectly natural. I don't think I feel like I would need the pro controller after trying that unless like I'm going to get like heavy into Street Fighter or something. All right, right, right. And that's that was that was one of the big concerns people had. The pro controller seemed very expensive. Yeah. Uh for the price and that's something we'll get into later. Yeah. I but, do not feel it's going to be a necessity for 90% of players. Yeah. Uh, with the Wii U and the Wii, I did feel like a pro controller was necessary, but now uh, the sw- I'm glad to hear that the Switch doesn't rest necessarily need it for most games. Yeah. Then I decided to, you know, I switched up really quickly to the free Joy Cons, right? Just totally separate in my hands. That's where it shined for me. Oh, really? So are you talking about, you know, Wiimote Nunchuck mode where they're separated out of the dock, out of the grip? And you can wiggle them around and everything? I, not even wiggling them around. I'm not, I, I mean, yeah, I could. But just using them as a controller that doesn't have to have my hands in front of Together. my chest. Yeah. I just I naturally fell into this pose with like one hand just like kind of hanging down by my side and maybe one hand in front of me. And it just felt so relaxing. Like I could just easily shift my, my position and seat. I, I just... It was just so casual and relaxed, and it just felt like the most natural thing. It's like why, it, it, it's like why do I have to have my hand like always up front in my chest, held up a little bit, or I could just have my hand just far apart, and it, it totally was naturally and and like this guy is a game. It's not like a game of like Twitch, you know. So I'm picking a unit, I'm walking around a castle RPG style. Great. That's kind of the dream, I think, because the Wii U or the Wii. With the nunchuck controller, almost got to that point. You can, you had more flexibility in what position you could play, 
but there's still the wire tethering the two pieces yeah. together. You you had you still had that limitation, so you can't truly relax as versatile as uh, as this seems. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I just like my I just felt very natural like that, and I can definitely tell that that's going to be the main way I play most games. Yeah, so you're not sometimes you're not even going to bother with a with a grip, aren't you? Probably not. I'm probably not going to bother with a grip for most of the time, and that's also really good for because when I'm going to be taking this thing on the road, or if I'm taking it like on my daily trip, it means they don't have to pack the grip along for the ride i can just yeah exactly yeah i can just like prop it up and i can just use these two individual things the 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 grip is not a necessity it might like i said it might be a nicety at home or when i'm playing a particularly intense type of game or something yeah and that's definitely an experience i bet they really worked hard on just Mm -hmm. because they expect people to play on the tablet mode mounted on a table so Mm -hmm. that's something that's something uh, they really needed to get right, and I'm happy to hear that they did. A little something I noticed also is like I felt like the joysticks themselves are a little tighter than I felt in other systems. Um, it took a little getting used to, like compared to let's say even like the the nunchucks or uh, I'm thinking even way back again like the or analog sticks on you know your yeah. PlayStation controller. It's a little tighter. It it takes a little more force to get it to uh, move the way you want. I like that. I, I, I could see some people maybe, I don't know, it, it, it being a little more adjusting to get because it might be harder or might take a little more precision thumb work to get exactly where you are. But I think it's rewarding to someone with strong thumbs like me that <laughs> want to move it. Um, I don't know. It just doesn't yeah. feel like it's flopping around everywhere. I'm, I'm kind of with you there. I'm, I'm a fan of uh, joysticks that have a little bit more resistance to them. So Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so then I tried out how to you know switch it to a tablet mode, which was nice. Um, it, it, it it takes a little practice, I'll say though, to get the Joy Cons out of the grip. It it, it 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 wasn't super easy the first time. I did practice a couple times, and then like like okay, how how slick can I slide these things out of here? <laughs> yeah, they make it look so easy on in the the trailers. So yeah, because you have to hit the little <laughs> buttons that release the the locks on them and. Uh, it's it's hard to do them both simultaneously, you know. It's like re- reloading two Uzis at the same time. You got to get that <laughs> wrist action going, you know. I, I bet after a while it's going to become muscle memory. So it right will. now it feels a bit foreign, but over time it's going to be pretty easy. Yeah. Uh, yep, so then I slid them in. That was really easy, taking it out. The only thing that made it hard taking it out was the fact that everything was, like, bolted to the TV so no one could, like, steal a switch <laughs> Run there. off with it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Everything was really bolted. That was a little getting in the way. But uh, then I tried it on there. Pretty smooth in tablet mode. I really can't, you know, it was a good... It, it, it felt a little lighter than, let's say, the um, the tablet from the Wii U. A little more mobile. And, okay, um, okay. And I was comfortable with it, but I was pretty hooked to the, you know, the 1080p on the screen. So um, I didn't use it like that for long, but I did play it like for about five, ten minutes just to see this is what I'm going to be playing on the road mostly. Get used to this. It does – when you do it back and forth though instantly, it does make the graphical difference stand out. Right, right. I bet you can definitely tell the difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it it might be the only thing that hurts the quality, the perceived quality of tablet mode. Because when you're looking at that big, beautiful TV screen, and then you instantly go to tablet mode, it's going to make it, it's going to accentuate that sh- that drop in the graphical fidelity, which is, you know, what they have to do. It obviously can't be the, you know, the same quality in mobile mode but it's it's going to be one of those things that's going to make me want to play it on a tv more often than i probably would normally it's i kind of liken it to when how i have a hard time going back to a normal 3ds after playing the xl you know like like i have that bigger screen and now i can't it's very hard for me to play on a normal screen again so i'm sure that'll take a little bit of getting used to but it's I, I feel like that's growing pains. That's something that it's uh, your mind should be able to set its expectations for after a while. Probably, probably, and you know, again, it depends on how much I actually play at home. So yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, 
Um, and so, yeah, that's all the modes there. And, oh, yeah, I did try out because I did get to try the uh, – I played ARMS, so I got to try out the other mode. With You know, it's just funny because it's such a small difference in using it in, like, a controller with, like, the free Joy-Cons right. in controller mode. But then just rotating them 90 degrees – for the for you know for for boxing mode basically in arms and it feels like a very it feels like a totally different controller like that yeah so the the joy cons are pretty versatile in that way then yeah just rotating them 90 degrees in my hand and now i feel those shoulder buttons under my you know fingers you know they 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 were the shoulder buttons if you were using them Normally. Or, like, if you're using them as, like, the individual controllers, the sharing the joy mode, right? But those L and R buttons become, like, finger triggers, basically, when you're in punching mode. You know, there's just so many. I can't even think of names for all these modes. And then, um, and I just felt like I still had access to all the possible buttons, whereas opposed to, you know, prefer before, if I was using, let's say, a nunchuck controller, once you're in boxing mode, you really don't have buttons other than maybe, like, the one joystick. Yeah, and then the A button from the the actual Wii mode itself. Yeah, I still had a full selection of buttons, and I had the joystick to go and select options from menus very seamlessly. Very yeah, sweet. Th- that sounds really well designed. It, I feel like Nintendo learned a lot of lessons from its past consoles. Honestly, feels like everything that they learned from the Wii and the Wii U built into one ultimate console. So we'll see how that goes, right? Um, the only thing I had a little bit tough time adjusting to was playing with a single Joy-Con. I was playing Sonic Mania. Uh, it did feel like a small controller there. It was a little tough. I, I, I got used to it. And I do think it will just not become an issue over time. But using it as a solo controller did feel a little small in my hands. And it was a little, you know... It takes a little time to get used to that. Right. I could imagine that's probably the mode that's most difficult to, to adapt, just because we're not really ever used to playing with controllers that small. Yeah. but you know, Everything again, else feels like an adaptation or an evolution of something we've played before. Yeah. I mean, but then again, I did do quite well in that stage of, of Sonic Mania, which was fun and felt extremely... You know, I, I was never a Sonic fan. I never really played him. I mean, I never got a chance to get into Sonic, but playing it there felt like I was playing a classic Sonic game all over again. And, uh, you know, the control was all I needed for that. Yeah, I think I think that's what they're going for. All right, do you want to go over the games from the Treehouse? And if it's a game I played there, I'll recount my tales from the event. Absolutely, let's go for it. Okay, um, so early on in the Treehouse presentation, we got to see Ultra Street Fighter 2, The Final Challenge, always with the tight names on these games. So I, I really like how over-the-top the title screen and the, and the naming <laughs> yeah. of the Street Fighter 2 convention is. Ultra Street Fighter 2. You know, it didn't even occur to me that it was intentionally over-the-top. <laughs> yeah, I mean, of course. I don't know, because, like, I, I, I guess I just assume, because they always have that name, like, those crazy titles. I just assume that's just how they do it. But, yes, I guess it was intentionally silly. Right. This is definitely a throwback title to, you know, play off of the nostalgia of Street Fighter 2. And, honestly, uh, Street Fighter 2 HD Remix was already released, and I loved that. <laughs> and being able to bring this on the go wherever I want is incredibly exciting. Yeah, and it's going to have online multiplayer. So there are so many people who, like Street Fighter 2 is just still the fighting game. It's like the one that birthed all modern day fighting games. Yes, exactly. And to have online multiplayer for that again on a major console is going to like totally revitalize that community and just going to be intense. Right, it's definitely it's definitely alive right now because there the Street Fighter Two was re released in HD a while mm-hmm. back, but this is the ultimate mode. They added two new characters, which is Evil Ryu and Violent Ken. Uh, they added new game modes. Obviously, with the Nintendo Switch, there's more control modes. But ultimately, I'm I'm just excited to be able to bring it with me on the go and be able to play multiplayer with people online from a Wi-Fi network anywhere. If if you ever played Street Fighter 2, loved it as a kid, and just never picked up the HD version, 
This is the one to get. This is amazing. I think it looks better in old school. I mean, like, you know, the new one. Because you probably... would, Casey. You would. I think it's the classic. Also, though, the new graphics just look off to my eyes. That's all it is. Right. Um, functionally the same, but the old gla- graphics just are very familiar, and I and I know where attacks are coming from a little clearer. Yeah, I could definitely see that. And um, honestly, I didn't even realize how exciting this type of game would be to share the joy with. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So you can do yeah two players very easily with the uh, share the joy mode. I didn't even think about that mode, but bring your Nintendo Switch with you anywhere, and I'm pretty sure any old school gamer will know how to play Street Fighter too. Yeah, that means you so, have a Street Fighter tournament anywhere. <laughs> yeah, it's and that's going to be a blast. Yeah, very much so. Very much so. So next up, they had pretty good long like clips between the each game they showed off and then we could just watch people playing different things at the uh even games that they didn't like show off you got to see a few of and we'll like you know touch upon some of those but the next game they went into was snipper clips yeah snipper clips looked like fun i was honestly a little skeptical of it at first and it didn't seem like it had much to it but once they started playing the game and going through the puzzles and communicating with each other it honestly looked kind of crazy. It looked fun to me. I call this, this is the first date game I've seen in a very long time. <laughs> this, okay. No, yeah, this, I can see it, though. No, I can yeah. totally see it. They haven't made one of these kind of games. Like, like Bubble Bobble was considered like the first date game. It was a game that was simple. You could play with you know, uh, someone you're you know, out with, either in an arcade or at home. And you can cooperatively have fun in a lighthearted but yet still kind of like you know mutually working together way um so yeah this is a weird puzzle game where you're both these pieces of paper with funny faces and legs and you're set with different obstacles or tasks like you either have to get your characters to you know fit a certain shape or press a button or you know get a basketball and a hoop and you have to kind of cut each other (laughs) With your bodies, like, you cut the other person into certain shapes, and you just have to team up, like, jump on each other's heads and figure out these puzzles together. But it's definitely a co-op thing. I guess you could play it one player and just swap controls between one or the other character. But working together as a two-player game is really where this is going to shine and really going to have a a fun time bonding with someone over. Right. The, The gameplay actually reminded me of... If you remember Scribblenauts back in the day, it kind of had a re- similar. Yeah, it re- it reminds me of Scribblenauts, where you're you're given a stage, you're given a situation, mm-hmm. you have an uh, I guess a, a vague idea of what the solution should be, mm-hmm. and now you have to team up with your friend to figure out how to get that solution going. And there are a few I've seen that there are a few different solutions to most of the puzzles, so you don't have to like always do it one way you might think of like oh you know what if i jump on top of this and then you throw me in the air i can get the basketball in the hoop faster that way or you know yeah exactly and the characters are cute uh the art style is adorable and the best part it's only 20 bucks that's a that's gonna be a big seller for it i think uh as a fun puzzle game that's you know got its own cute style and it's as a twenty buck title probably the only twenty dollar title that I've seen yet. That's going to be a big right. deal. Yeah, and and honestly, if if you want to get someone who ha- isn't a huge gamer into a game, this this seems like something that you can pick up and and play with someone. Yeah, and you can just instruct them in what to do and figure out the puzzles together, and that seems like a, a, a fun time. It seems like the kind of game you could just mess around with on the screen, not even solving the puzzle for a while, and just have fun yeah. messing around for a bit, and then be like, all right, let's get this puzzle out of the way. All right, all right. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, going down the list, we got Has Been Heroes, that a surprising number of people are very hyped about. Yeah, I, I definitely think the the idea of Has Been Heroes is really cool. I like that the theme is about heroes who are past their prime. Mm-hmm. They're now just doing jobs that aren't really aren't really related to going on big adventures. And now their final adventure that they were conscripted to do is to escort the king's children to school or something. Yeah, right, exactly. And, I, I, and that, was, that was funny to me. 
And the gameplay itself looked kind of like, you know, Plants vs. Zombies mixed with a roguelike RPG. Yeah. It, it is a game where you just keep going until you die, basically. And, it you know, the, the, the challenges amp up. Uh, it does feel like, yeah, like a Plants vs. Zombies kind of game, but a little more action-y in that you will be powering up your characters as you go. Um, different monsters come up every time you play, so it's not the same challenge. Different maps, so you have to choose paths uh, at certain points of where you want to go. Uh, the, you could pause the action any time and kind of like, you know, switch up your strategy or switch up the positioning. And um, it seems like there's a lot of options on how you build up your characters and how you approach the different challenges that you'll face could could be really good. It, it's I did not get my hands on. It. I watched plenty of people play it. I couldn't quite follow everything that was going on on the screen, but they all seemed to really catch on fast. Like once once it was in people's hands, they seemed to get what they were doing and had a, had a pretty fun time doing it. Right, watching the the stream on on the treehouse, it looked like it's a game that you can really get a rhythm to. Yeah, because you you choose which unit. Uh, which class you want to control, you move that class to a different lane by pressing a specific button, and then you press that button again to attack, and and you use that mechanic to war- uh, stave off zombies coming in towards you. So after a while, you're going to get into that rhythm of switching classes to lanes, attacking, switching mm-hmm. a class back, attacking next, switching around, attack, and casting spells, using items, etc. And it seems like it's something you can have fun with. It feels very much like a mobile style of game. And it, it, it does adapt well to, I guess, the Switch in that way. Like, this is the kind of game I might not play, like, at home for a very long time, but I feel like I would definitely play this on the go. On as the go. like yeah, yeah, as like a, you know, time killer at a place. Like a short, you could probably play this in a shorter play session than a deep game like Zelda or something. Yeah, and I feel like I, that's a really good idea for it. It feels like a mobile game, but for this type of gameplay, I'm really grateful for the Nintendo Switch's buttons, physical buttons. Yeah, right, right, This right. seems This seems fast-paced, and it can be twitchy enough where you would really want to have physical buttons to, to press. You know, that's a good thing. I didn't even think about that recently where I should have – that, yeah, the – with the switch kind of crossing the boundary we are able to finally play like m- games that are designed for the mobile world but actually have those great home like console buttons and controls that have held back mobile gaming for ages exactly now. exactly it should be relatively simple to transfer mobile games over to a tablet switch but then make it easier with those ta- with those uh, physical controls. So that's another plus to the Nintendo Switch as a console. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you want to save Zelda as the last game we touch upon since it's so big and stuff? Oh yeah, and I even think at some point we should dedicate a whole episode to it. We've, yeah, that's that's fine by me. All right, so we'll save that as the last game. We'll let's jump over that and go into uh, One Two Switch. What to switch? Yes. Did you try this one out yourself, Casey? I did not try it out myself. There was a very long line for it. Honestly, I was I was quite surprised at that. Yeah, it's. I bet it's. They're very. People are very curious about how the game feels to play. Mm-hmm. It's because it, it's one of those games that you watch it and it looks like it's people doing silly things in front of each other. It looks fun. But it's not sixty dollars fun. I think it's. it's and yeah. I, it's it's one of those situations where people would like to try it and play it, and then once they've played it, they can form a more valid opinion, solid opinion about it. It looks like fun. With that in mind, honestly, and, and, and I know we, people have been discussing, very commonly said, this is a game that feels like it should have been bundled in with the Switch. And, and, right. And Reggie came in, he, there's a really good interview I'm going to link to, uh, where he kind of talked about that and a few other things. But, you know... It would be tough to do that and keep the Switch at the price point it's at right now. But um, what would be a possibly a good medium or you know halfway measure with that would be maybe if they just included a demo of this with one or two of the mini games installed on the Switch. Yeah, I think that would have been a really good way to go. Though, 
yeah, I think that that's, that's a demo would be right. I, my biggest hesitation would be whether people would not buy it because they didn't like the two specific demo games, but they might have liked all the other games that the Switch One Two Switch game would have. Mm-hmm. For those of you who haven't seen it, so it is a series of you know short games. Uh, most all of them seem to be one on one games, so each player just has to have half of a you know share the joy controller. And they're very quick things, like quick draw, which is just basically, you know, you hold your you know, controller at your side, and when the game says draw, you pull and you shoot, and fastest draw that actually shoots at the other player uh, wins. It, the, the, the thing they keep focusing on is that it's a game you don't actually look at the screen to play. All the games encourage you to stare at your opponent in the eyes with, like, the switch to, like, your side, so you're not even looking at it. Yeah. Which is kind of You're, funny. I, yeah. Most of the gameplay is from the sounds that the Joy-Cons produce and the motion rumble that you feel when you're holding it. Right. That's that's definitely an interesting concept, and it's something I'm sure a lot of people wanted to try for themselves. Right. Which is, yeah, which is partly why the line is probably so long. Yeah, and you, and you only look at the screen to see, like, who won a particular round or, you know, check your status in the game. Uh, some of the other games we saw was the... Uh, Cow milking game, which uh, <laughs> that looked a little silly on the treehouse. The samurai training game, where you uh, basically have to just—it's kind of a reflex tester. You know, one person has right. a sword, the other has to block it when the other person slams. Um, a copy dance game, which I'm really curious how it rates the scoring of how you're posed because it's. You know, I with, think. Yeah. Yeah, I think when you're you're in your posed a specific way, it keeps track of the. The measurements or, you know, the angling and position of the gyroscope in the Joy-Con. And if the other one is able to match that metric, then it'll score it properly. I guess, I mean, like... if Technically, yeah. that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's fun. It, it's, it's just funny because, like, I just... I could picture people who would just be lame and all they do is just move the, you know, the controller... In the direction that it should be facing, because it, it doesn't know if your other hand is up in the air or your leg is kicking out to the side. Right. <laughs> I, I guess they I guess they rely on an honor system that you're not going to like scam it like that. Yeah, and that's that would kind of spoil the fun of it. If you're if you're if you're going to be like that, you wouldn't be playing one two switch in the first place. I guess you're right. I guess you're right. But anyway, I I, I feel like this is a game that. Uh, probably is going to miss its mark, especially at that price point there. Especially at the price point, but it, the concepts are interesting, and I want to see uh, where these essentially tech demos go mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in other games. Okay, uh, next up is the game we saw also at the uh, presentation event was ARMS. Yeah, ARMS looks really cool. Yeah, 3D fighting spring-loaded ARM game. Rock'em Sock'em robot style. So this one is this one that you actually got to try? I did try this. In fact, I have a video nice. of me playing someone in this one here. Oh boy! Okay. Um, what they said in the treehouse actually is very true. It does have the Yomi element, the rock paper scissors prediction. It's no, it's definitely very interesting. People are looking at it and it, and they're, they're saying that it looks so simple and pointless. But I am very excited for this. I think there's a lot of hidden depth to it. It is. It, it's, it's easy to access that depth. I mean, the girl I was playing against obviously didn't know what she was doing. But by the second match, she was starting to... like. At first, she was just kind of wildly throwing her arms. Sometimes she was throwing just by accident. And she started to realize like how risky it is to throw when I'm you know punching because that's like the count the hard counter to it. Um, by the second game, she was timing that she, like she wasn't just throwing flurries of punches. She was maneuvering. She was waiting for me to you know expose myself to her option of choice. Like once she saw me try to actually like block because I started blocking because all she was doing was punching for a while then she's like oh when he goes to block I'm gonna go for the throw right away and she was expecting it she read the move and she went for it and it was pretty fun and uh yeah and I I like that it essentially captures the fundamentals of a good fighting game Mm -hmm. you know as you mentioned there's timing there's figuring out what 
of the three moves your opponent is going to do. There's spacing because you can go left to right and, and jump and everything like that. There's zoning where you want to make sure to check your opponent's position. It's it, it looks like a ton of fun. And the fact that they have different characters with unique abilities is interesting as well. I think it's going to be a game where those different levels are going to present themselves in a gradual progression. Like we just played and all we were really worried about that first game was, am I punching? Am I throwing? Or am I blocking slash dodging? Right? Which of those things am I doing and which do I think she's going to do uh, you, know, you know, to counter? But very soon after, and I think with that in mind, like your first game, just play with the basic fists. I love the yeah. idea of customizing your two different fists with the, every character has three different options. Yeah. And then once you kind of get that basic, now you can start to throw in that mix of, all right, now I have one hand that does the hook. And that will force them into a position where my punch is a more threatening move. And how do they deal with me? messing with that rock paper scissors game and then they're going to start wearing combos like all right once i get them to fall for that trick how do i maximize the damage and so on and so forth and yeah i think that you're going to very easily graduate from one level to another even if you're not someone who's ever been into fighting games yeah and i i like that that this game allows for those mind games Mm -hmm. there's a there's a lot of planning in your head and risk reward taking here but there's not the difficulty of execution where you need to learn long strings of combos no, yeah, definitely not uh, etc I, I like that it's it's fundam- the fundamental mind games of a strong fighting game without that barrier of entry yeah i can't say for certain if i've seen anything that felt super unique about the characters yet maybe that'll come as i learn to appreciate the different weapons they can equip so I would. I was not. They. They all felt the same to me now at this level. Yeah. So uh, from from the from the treehouse video itself, I know that each character has its own special traits. Mm-hmm. Like the ninja. I think the ninja's name is Ninjara. Yeah. Uh, whenever he sidesteps, he actually turns invisible for a certain period of time. So you're not necessarily going to be aware of where his next punch is going to come. That's from. pretty cool. See, yeah, that's, that's yeah. the kind of stuff that. I probably yeah. didn't pick up on right away there. Yeah, exactly. And the the big mummy, I believe, during certain attacks, he has super armor. So if you see an attack coming towards you, you might be able to just tank it and then attack at that very moment ah. to hit them back even harder. So he's kind so of the, 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 the grappler Zangief style. Yeah, kind of like that. And it's it's definitely interesting to see what, uh, what they have in store for this game. Mm-hmm. I don't know if there are going to be any more characters than the ones demoed. I, there were. They, I, I, I heard I that was so. just the four for now, and it, there will, there'll be a whole roster when it comes out. The stages, yeah, okay. I feel, are something that we didn't pay much attention to, though, because the stages have different traits. Like, there was the basic one, and they had the trampolines around the outside that you could utilize. Oh, yeah. But we saw in the treehouse there was one stage that had kind of a thing in the center, like a little pillar... But that can break away, and that reveals a trampoline in the center of the stage that you can now utilize in uh, different ways as as the match goes on. See, I I, I really think this is going to be a game that I'm gonna I'm gonna actually get into. I might. I, I I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about this is definitely on my list of things I might buy one day when I feel like when I'm finished with Zelda, or maybe even when I'm like just looking for something different. I might buy this early on. Yeah, honestly, th- if. I'm hoping there's online multiplayer for this game because this is, seems like something that would be really fun to either record videos about or play with with our community. I'm fairly certain they said it would be, so yeah, I'm pretty I'm pretty confident yeah. this will happen. I'm hoping it does. Honestly, this game reminds me of Pokémon Tournament. It's okay. a game that yeah that has the block grab attack mm-hmm. uh, trifecta triangle. And it's a game where people are really thinking it's super simple, but actually has a lot of hidden depth to it. So mm-hmm. we'll uh, see. We got to see Bomber, Super Bomberman R, which is a great return of the game, of the, the Bomberman series, which was traditionally like my favorite four-player game, at least, on the original, uh, on, well, the one I played for Super Nintendo. I think it just had a lot of little bells and whistles, but it's basically Bomberman, which is more than enough for a lot of people. 
Yeah, honestly, uh, I ha- there hasn't been a good Bomberman game for a long time, and this one is probably something I'm going to get during launch either. It, I played the heck out of it on Super Nintendo and, and just nev- non-stop. Yeah. So if I could get online player with that too and just have that, yeah. that that's really cool. That's really cool. Yeah, I know, th- I know there's co-op modes uh, with the same Switch, so you can share the joy and play a co-op story mode with it. So That's true. Yeah, that seems cool in its own, mm-hmm. and I'm sure the multiplayer is going to be just as fun as it has ever been. Yeah, that's yeah, pretty much everything you expect from a Bomberman with better graphics and a few new little doodads yeah exactly uh mario kart 8 deluxe we got to see a little bit of here as well in the treehouse uh, it looks great uh, it's it's one of the games where they confirmed it's it's 1080p 60 frames per second steady on this tv and 720p 60 frames per second steady on the handheld mode that's pretty amazing so the, yeah yeah that's that's where we got those uh spec details on Cool, cool, cool. Uh, and they also, the big addition to this, first off, it has a battle mode, which I didn't realize was something yes. that was missing from Mario Kart 8. Yes. So if Mario Kart 8 had a battle mode, but all it was was you going on the long racing tracks, but without a race. Oh, that's it. So, so yeah. Yeah, so the maps... Out. Yeah, so the maps are are the same racing maps that you would race on, mm-hmm. but instead you would just have balloons and the, you'd uh, go around getting items and shooting each other. Okay. The problem with that is that the or the maps weren't built for battle mode, mm-hmm. so it would t- sometimes take such a long time to even run into someone, and so, it didn't. It wasn't all that great. Yeah. So this did show up. The the, the battle mode they co- showed off was called Babam Blast. Um, it's basically, there is an arena and all of the item blocks give you are bombs and you can hold up to 10 of them. I believe Right. You, you get a number of balloons, uh, five balloons. And there was a couple of subtle detail sort of rules I thought were great for really maximizing the fun of this. Right. I, yeah. One, you, you, you're never knocked out. Even if you lose all your balloons, all that means is your final score is halved. So you could still win if you lost all your balloons, if you just knocked a ton of people out while you were on the way there. And so that means that you don't, you can't win just by playing it safe. You can't just be the last guy standing and hid in the corner the whole time. You have to kill people to score, and you only play defensively when you're down to like your last balloon or two. Right, and this is definitely... A really great addition for for Mario Kart's battle mode. This isn't just exclusive to Bob on Blast. Mm-hmm. This losing all balloons halves your score rule applies to all of the battle mode now. Okay. Okay. And yeah. 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 It's a great way to make sure that player elimination isn't completely boring. Mm-hmm. And it, I, I agree, it's definitely a good balancing act for for the game. I saw twelve characters on the map at once. I'm guessing eight. Like real players, or was it uh, possibly? Even so it was 12? really twelve characters. I, I thought it was just eight characters. I was look. I counted at the end um, when they showed the rankings. There was twelve characters. I'm thinking eight players, humans, and then four AI. I can see that. I can see that. That's, that's insane, and like that's a that's a really hectic battle mode. I think it's going to be a lot of fun, though. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and I also like that they highlight the the leader. With a crown. Very good. Very useful. Right. So you could just know, all right, there's the guy to bring this, down. <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of like uh, an equalizer. So if someone yeah. is dominating the game completely, you want to take them down because you want to l- break all their balloons and have their score. Yep. That's so, and every, everyone who's not winning at that point is inclined to to take that player down because of that score half mecha- mm-hmm. mechanic. A very Mario Kart kind of thing. Yes, exactly. And we got uh, a couple of new characters added in. They confirmed Inkling Boy and Girl added, along with King right. Boo and Dry Bones. Yeah, I think that's going to be really cool. Yeah, and it'll have all the D- DLC characters are going to be in there, too. Right, exactly. And I'm actually wondering, I, I know one of the strange DLCs for Mario Kart 8 was a, I don't know if it was a Mitsubishi car or was it a an M Mercedes car? 
But it was a real life car that they put into Mario Kart 8 <laughs> as a free DLC. And I it was kind of funny and I'm wondering if they're going to include that here too. It's 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 a it's a Mercedes Benz in Mario Kart 8. <laughs> <laughs> so who knows if they're actually going to bring that in, you know? <laughs> who knows? Um, and then some, a couple of the little titles we got to see between games, and some of the I, I mentioned, I played uh, Sonic Mania. Again, I'm not a Sonic guy, so I can't tell you how close it is to a you know a classic Sonic, but it felt great and it looked like a classic Sonic game. So uh, I don't know. I I know that everyone always complains that all the new Sonic games aren't up to par, up to par with the classics. And I know always made someone always made the joke is that like oh they just want Sonic Two re released forever or something like that maybe this is that because this this feels like what people have been asking for I don't right know. and and I know they even released ads that were <laughs> that harkened to the old eighties Sonic era mm-hmm. so so I'm pretty sure they're well aware of who this game is for that, that'd be hilarious if it like finally came out on a Nintendo system the, the Sonic everyone wanted. Yeah, it, yeah, it's gonna be fun. It's yeah, I'm, it's something I'm gonna pick up for sure. Puyo Puyo Tetris. Uh, what an interesting combination. Puyo Puyo Tetris. So, are you able to play Tetris by itself or Puyo Puyo Pop by itself? I only saw this weird mix of the two types of games with Tetris pieces and the colors and the combos matching like that and. Uh, I couldn't tell you what the, what was going on on the screen. I didn't quite understand like what the game mode was. So, uh, but it, it definitely looks like some combination of the two types of gameplays. Uh, I I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> they they have to have in a game like that the uh, you know each version of it separate as well. That's honestly super interesting to me because they're different games, but I, there is a definitely definitely clear way you can mix the two. Yeah, exactly, exactly. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 I want to look deeper into that when I get a chance. And uh, Minecraft, we heard about. Of course. And, and they showed off some snowboarding game in the trailers, but I, I didn't see anything else about that really at the events or anything. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. All right, do you want to dive into the uh, the Zelda demo and the information oh, we saw? This is the big one. Yes, yes. Zelda Breath of the Wild. You played 20 minutes of it. Tell us what you think. I'll just say... I was very pulled into the world of this Zelda as soon as soon as I started playing because they had like the you know the Nintendo people were there to make sure you knew what you were doing and kind of like coach you right. through the demo. I I wanted him away. I was every time he was telling me what to do. I was like, you're you're making me remember the real world exists because I am so <laughs> like engrossed. I was very engrossed very quickly. Like away with you. This was my moment. I don't want to see any more trailers or let people playing uh, demos of this because stumbling upon things just intrigued me. Like I got out of the cave and immediately I'm walking around the world and I just see ruins of those guardians, right? Those weird like uh, octopus monsters with the laser eyes. Yeah, the guardians. Those look really cool. I mean, and I just see, like, some of them, like, strewn about. Like, they've been there for a 100 years with moss and everything. And I just, like, crawled on top of these things. And I'm just looking at it. I'm, like, in awe of, like, what was this? You know? And, like, could this thing come to life right now and just kill me in, 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 in an instant? Right. It definitely has that looming presence when you approach one. It kind of reminds me of an eldritch horror. Yes, very where much. It's it's one of those monsters that are make you question what's going on. Yes, it elicits a very deep fear just by their design and that mystery behind them. Yeah, and by and by the the way they attack and how threatening they are with with that laser beam. <laughs> I really wish I didn't see the the the, the them playing this on the treehouse because if I encountered one of these like fresh without having seen any of that I, I would have wet my pants because <laughs> that was so intense. Like, not just the way, like, it saw Link in the Treehouse video from, like, across the map. Like, it just, like, sees him in the distance on his horse. And then it just starts that weird shambling clomber towards him. And then the eye beam charging up. 
and you run and you dive and, and if you don't have enough energy to like dive out of the way and that laser beam hits with such force and an explosion it's very action movie and they don't relent yeah. and it did not relent it's so creepy and exciting how it fixates on you even when you're on a horse yeah like, you're going to run away while you're on a horse and it's still threatening you from a distance. You can still feel its presence even when you're so far away. And if you don't have enough, like, oomph, if you run out of breath at the wrong time and and it locks on, that's it. One shot, bam, and you see Link explode and he's on fire and he's dead and it's just, ugh. But you know what also excites me with the Guardian? Mm-hmm. The Amiibo. That's true. There's a very cool Amiibo. Doesn't the Amiibo look insane? That's huge. And it's poseable. It's poseable. It's bigger than the base itself, so it sticks out of the base uh-huh. uh, quite a bit. And it's only 20 bucks. That's that's not bad. That's For that thing, that kind of statuette, that's pretty amazing, actually. Yeah, it's a, it, it's, it's a sturdy statue. It's well-made, well-printed, and I'm... Definitely gonna get one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know if that's something that you would be into, but I, I love amiibos, and that's, it's the first of its kind. If so. I'm gonna buy an amiibo, it's definitely high on my list of ones I'd consider. If I'm gonna yeah, buy it's... any amiibo, uh, yeah, they did show off a whole bunch. They have the Bacoblin, they had the Link, and they had the Zelda ones. Yeah, it's definitely. It was interesting to see how their costumes were. Very similar this time. Yep. It, it's it. She her outfit didn't seem as princessly. She did look more like an adventurer, similar to Link. Yep, and she had the Sheikah slate as well. Exactly. So I I wonder what story implications that might have. It'd be very interesting if she is in any way a controllable character, or at least alluded to that she's on her own adventure. Yeah, it's it's kind of. I want to see how this goes. Speaking of how things went, so I was. Poking around the world, I definitely learned very quickly how the, the the world is wild, and the world is don't don't just go poking your head and thinking you're the man like you are used to in other Zelda games, because if you just start poking around like a hot like a buck goblin nest and without a plan, <laughs> they take you out. Yeah, that's that's actually kind of interesting to me. It's the challenge there is it's. Sounds like it should be. With real tactics, like they sent down an axeman to like just kind of occupy me and get in the way between me and the archer who's like you know, half a mile away plugging me with arrows every chance he gets. Yeah, I, I really learned to like respect this land very quickly. <laughs> right. And uh, talking about it like this really makes me want this game even more. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it seems like a game that you can really spend a lot of time with. Especially considering they're including horse riding and taming. Yeah, that was a whole system. So you you can tame, you could ride a horse, but if you just mount any random horse, it doesn't really listen to you much. Um, there's different quality of horses you can find. Some might be faster, but a little harder to tame. Uh, you could take them to the place to get saddled. Yeah, and I, I believe some horses are better for combat mm-hmm. like yeah, you, you combat. have mounted combat in this game mm-hmm. so that's uh, it's very fascinating and, and i know you can lose the horse if you're not careful they could die in battle oh really you have to take care of them in battle sir really i didn't know that that's you know that's actually really fascinating because if you really like a horse and you're forced to be into in, in a battle You've you've spent a lot of time with that thing. Maybe there's a degree of camaraderie that you've built with your the creature that you tamed. Agro. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just like just like in we've made this comparison in the past. Just like in Shadow of the Colossus, yeah. the horses might be something you might grow attached to, and it seems like a, a different dimension to to Zelda that we haven't really experienced before. I like that they also showed how, like, if a horse really knows its way and you've trained it a lot, uh, it can go on autopilot and it'll just follow a road while you can actually, like, look around and just, like, let it autopilot you someplace. Yeah, it reminds me of those uh, those flight path mounts yes. in World, World of Warcraft. Warcraft. Yes, exactly, exactly. So, yeah. Uh, the weather change, we saw a lot of that. Uh, the bullet time for the arrows, that was really awesome. 
<laughs> yeah, it, it honestly looked really cool to see, and uh, I, I don't remember if that's new to Zelda or not. It seems like it would be new for Zelda. Yeah, I mean, when else have you been able to, like, jump in the air and then, like, slow down time to, like, aim in 3D like that? And uh, I also like they just mentioned in there that if it's a stormy weather and there's lightning, you, you, you might want to take off your metal equipment because lightning will strike your sword and harm you if you start swinging it around in the middle of a lightning storm. That's a, that's really cool right there. It essentially gives a purpose to all the old wooden swords and equipment <laughs> you usually throw away. Yeah, actually, that's true. Isn't that kind of interesting? Yeah, it'll force you into a really weird situation, I gotta say. That level of depth and detail is what's getting me so excited for this game. I want to be able to discover things like that. Where metal attracts lightning, so you don't want to use it in certain situations. Maybe something else happens where it's if it's raining so heavily, there's certain equipment that'll weigh you down more, and you want to take those off. I want to discover that type of stuff in in Breath of the Wild, and I feel so confident that they that they are there to I'm, discover. I'm really, really getting more and more like sad that I have to expose myself to all these spoilers, like about it. Not like spoilers, just like. I would love to have been just surprised by like by everything. Like, oh my gosh, did did, did lightning just strike my sword and kill me? <laughs> That's like right. the opposite of Skyward Sword, man. Yeah, I, I, f- I feel like they're not going to release any more details regarding Zelda other than what's been out there already. Yeah, there's going to be more surprises obviously, definitely, and uh I'm just I'm just going to try to save myself for as many of them as possible. So, as a quick note, um I believe people have calculated this as an estimate. If you played Skyrim, Skyrim was about uh, 32 kilometers, uh, square kilometers in size. Okay. So, uh, this Breath of the Wild Zelda game, it's going to be about 69 or 68 kilometers, wow. square kilometers. So if you think a game like Skyrim is huge... This Breath of the Wild world is 1.5 times the size of Skyrim. Ooh, baby, baby, Breath of the Wild world. Do, 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 do. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be good. Uh, talking about it more is making me really sad that we're not able to play it right this moment, Casey. Yeah, I know, I know. You know, not that much longer to go, sir. Not that much yeah, longer. 40-something days. Yes, yes. Yeah, so next episode, we're going to go into all the little news that's been building up. So that, But this was just, again, a really big event that we just had to dive in full force. Uh, I, I'll just, just to give you guys a teaser, we're going to talk about the online app that people have been talking about, uh, the price of all the different accessories that are coming out, and uh, just this uh, Reggie just having this great interview talking about lots of little features and... Uh, yeah, you know, some of the concerns people have. I'm, I'm uh, a little spoiler. Also, I'm going to be writing an uh, an article this week addressing the fear mongering that's been going on around the Switch lately. Yeah, and I think that's uh, that's a very good written article that should be out there. Yeah, I'm going to go I, I, piece by piece over every one of these things. Gauge the realism of it. You know, obviously every system is going to have some things to you know, be concerned about, but I do think that people are going overboard with some of these, uh, you know, some of these news articles, especially are going a little overboard with how they're presenting the, the challenges to the system. Right. And this is definitely something that, uh, we're branching out into, uh, having actual written content in our website is going to be interesting. Yeah. yeah. That's your forte. So I've been updating the website just today. I put all of our episodes on the, uh, homepage of the switchcast.com and that's where I'm going to be posting some of these articles uh, so let's see if I can get around to making that this week all right yeah that's that's very that's that's going to be worth checking out in the future all right let's uh, let's get on to the community pulse already Alright, so we definitely got a lot of questions and, and community involvement going on here. Uh, do you have any questions that you want to address really quickly? Uh, the first question by Jazz Overclocked, who asked me, 
How excited are you about Fire Emblem Warriors and the new Shin Megami Tensei game? I have very different reactions to both of those, ranging from super excited for Fire Emblem Warriors. We just saw the uh, Fire Emblem Direct right before this uh, was recorded, actually. It wasn't much we got to see. They just kind of uh, announced it. Maybe like we saw like Krom fighting a bunch of soldiers. Yeah, and it, it was mostly the same stuff they showed us in the in the presentation. Yeah, yeah. So we just, I mean, the presentation was just a little bit of a CGI trailer, but in this we did see a little bit of the in-game action combat. Yeah, which yeah, you know, it looked like a Dynasty Warriors game, and I'm very hyped because I do believe that they are going to be throwing in um, a, a lot of the uh, classic characters in there because that seems to be the way they're going to go. And uh, as for Shin Megami Tensei, I've never been into that series personally, so I'm probably not too excited about that. I'm not against it, but JV might have a different take on that. Well, I, you know, I've really only gotten into Shin Megami Tensei through the Persona series, mm-hmm. and from the art style they showed in the trailer, it's not part of that Persona timeline mm-hmm. or Persona line of games. So I'm excited. I have a lot of respect for Mega Ten, but... We'll see first. It's something that I want to see. I will first. play that Fire Emblem Heroes uh, game for more. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, I saw that and I was like, uh, "Don, I'm playing it." Very surprising. It's coming out on Android first, which is a uh, uh, pretty rare, actually. No, in the well, it's been confirmed. It's confirmed right now that they're releasing at the same time. It just recently got confirmed. Oh, like minutes ago. Yeah, oh, okay. on the Nintendo of America. Okay, because that's, that's coming out the first of next month or... Uh, yeah, February 2nd. Uh, 2nd of next month. So, all right, very yes. cool, very cool. Because they did specifically show uh, Nor and Hoshido. Like, it's going to have... That is going to have characters from every game in it. And uh, I just want to make my team of my favorites from uh, new and old games and see how long it takes me before I hit the paywall and I get an angry at the game. I feel like since this is Nintendo, they're pretty they're pretty good about paywalls i i feel like it's not going to be that bad compared to something like uh i don't know a, a lot of games in that genre this will be the ultimate test because this is a like a collector game you know you go to like the portal where you're going to summon characters um and that is usually the big money sink type games so we'll see how well nintendo is at keeping me interested and playing this game before I, you know, and, and me not getting tired of not getting characters I want. Who you want. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, th- I think that's fair. Okay. So I got a question from Jordan Duncan. Mm-hmm. Uh, he posted on our Facebook page. Hey, guys. I'm a noob with micro SDXC memory cards and have some questions. So this is a four-part question, and I'll address each one, one at a time. So which micro SDXC card is the best brand Slash value. So if you guys don't know, the Nintendo Switch will be supporting micro SD cards. SDXC is the, the best format out right now. And it's it's pretty expensive. Oh, but the brands you're looking for aren't particularly specific. As long as you have buy a brand that's relatively well known, then it's something it's it, it doesn't matter too much. Now, when it comes to purchasing an SDXC card with the right value, you always want to consider dollars per memory. So if a card gives you, let's say, 32 gigabytes of memory, you want to have spent about $10 for that card. So $1, 3 gigs. If it's 128 gigabytes of memory, then you might want to have spent about $40 for that card. It's about that. So that's uh, cost efficiency. Second question, is 95 megabytes per second the fastest speed, and does this matter? It is currently the fastest speed. Uh, The more standard speed that's more cost efficient is 80 megabytes per second. It does matter, but it's not something that you should worry about too much. How big of a card will be needed to hold 10 to 20 games? That's question three. We don't know that. And question four, If I upgrade to a bigger card later on, will I be able to transfer the games to the bigger card using my computer? I'm going to assume if since it's a micro SD format, you probably will be able to do that. So those are his four questions. I addressed them real quickly. There's JV's tech corner for everybody. 
<laughs> yeah, sorry if your eyes like gl- or ears glade o- glazed over <laughs> in that section, but it's good. It's good information, and no, a lot of people it's, it's, don't really know how to shop for for SD memory cards. This is where you shine. This is that's fine. I'm glad you were able to address those kind of questions here, because I would right. not be able to talk about any of that. Yeah, it's 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 an info dump, and if you guys have any other questions about this type of stuff, post on the Facebook page or drop by our Discord chat, and I'll be happy to help you out. Uh, at Sly Palafox messages us on Twitter. Do you think that voice chat handled through a paid app is a good idea? This is in reference to what I was mentioning before. Nintendo revealed re- a little bit more information about what their online service is going to be, and a big part of it and not all of it, is that the online chat is going to be handled through an app on your phone. I guess that's where they're going to put all the the buddy lists, where they're going to put, uh, where you're actually going to use to chat with other people. Um, I think this is an interesting choice. Yeah, definitely. People are joking about it as like, it's just a, how funny, I can use my phone now to communicate with friends. Yes, I know, it's kind of funny because that's what, you know, you do with it anyway, but that's kind of the point as I see it. That's what you're using. Like if Nintendo, where else, if Nintendo put the communication app in the game, right? Let's say put it in the switch. That means whenever you want to see who's playing or what you're going to play, you have to take out the switch. The phone is an easy way to click on the app, say, Oh, JV's started a Mario Kart 8 game. Or maybe, maybe that you'd be able to set an alert. Say, hey, let me know when JV's online. Like when I play a lot of online games like like um, Vainglory, my phone tells me when a friend logs on and is ready to play. That's going to help you get and actually organize those games and you know when to log on. You're not going to check your Switch every 10 minutes or you're not going to set your Switch to give you alerts. This is what's the kind of like reasons that it being on a mobile app is going to make sense in those ways. Now it's it's definitely funny that that was your takeaway. Uh, that was this. part of it, yeah. Yeah, it's, for me, the biggest takeaway that they would that this would be an advantage for is the fact that now you can use the phone for voice chat processing. Exactly. That's, yeah, that's extra processing. Yeah, that's extra processing power that your Nintendo Switch doesn't have to handle and can focus more on graphics fidelity or actual online gameplay consistency. Yeah. That's a big deal. It's basically creating another, I don't know, like how many gigahertz of uh, of RAM are in my you know yeah. phone, whatever. You're adding another you're adding another processor to your system that you just happen to own in your pocket and now they're conscripting it to work with your switch. And yeah, and I love that this that they're really integrating mobile apps into the switch. The parental controls feature is a separate app that you can integrate with an external switch. Mm-hmm. Now the the social features, you know, we've a lot of people have used Skype on their phone, Discord chat on their phone. This is no different than that. And I think it's it's actually a really good and smart way to offload the power requirements of voice chat onto something else that everyone already has. And honestly, here, well, here's, here's the other part of my takeaway is even if the chat was on the Switch, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to probably have loaded my Discord app on my phone and use that anyway because that's where my friends lists are. And if 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 the chat was in the Switch, you know, I think a half the people would probably be using some app on their phone anyway because there's a lot of great options there. If they put it on your phone anyway, you know, they're just they're just using the same tool that most of us are going to probably use for this anyway. Definitely. I, I agree with you there. And it's people are disparaging this as lazy or as a cop out. But I think this has a lot of potential and a lot of practical uses for it. Yeah, it's this. The mobile apps are the way of the future for gaming in all way. And they're actually doing something 
to incorporate them. I we, we we've always said Nintendo's stuck in the past and they haven't been willing to get with the future of like how games are done. This is how it is. This is this is how we do everything now is with your phone. And it's not like you're paying you're buying this app by itself. This is part of the online package. It's not the only thing that comes with it. All right. So right. get that exactly. Yeah, stop don't look at it as you're paying a monthly fee for this app. It's part of the things you're going to be getting. And we're probably going to see some more about what's going to come with this. Yeah, and once once we actually get the app and uh, get the features going, that's it's something we'll go into further depth on. But so far, I really think you uh, people shouldn't be disparaging this so yeah, soon. Yeah, I think it's an interesting start, and we're... There's there's probably some more to understand. So yes, uh, I'm I'm glad they brought up that question though. I'm glad you know. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, so Johnny Switch asked, "Why are the controllers so expensive?" It's a good question. Um, <laughs> no, it, it, it's a very good question. I mean, um, it's this one's actually this one's very difficult to address. But I feel like the price question is something we're all kind of thinking about right now. Right. So if we look right now on the Nintendo switch buy now page and they list all the price of all the uh, accessories and the system bits um the actual controller did he did he say the joy con specifically or why are the controllers okay so i'm assuming the joy con and or the pro yeah so the pro controller by itself is 70 dollars and the joy cons are 80 dollars for each pair or 50 dollars for one like half of one like one, a left or a right, right. Joy Con. Um, yeah. I, I mean, all right. My best answer for this is that there is a lot of technology going on in each one of these, right? I, they don't yes. want to make them super expensive, all right? But they, they and, I, and, and, I, and I think they're deceptively simple looking. They look like Wiimotes, they look like little waggle things, but there is a lot, there's a ton going on inside these things. Yes, uh, that's that's absolutely right. Yeah, you got the – what do they call that thing that reads the Amiibos? Uh, NFC reader. The NFC reader in there. It's got the infrared pointer. It's got the gyroscope, you know, um, accelerometer controls. It's got the, um, you know, the rumble, that, that, that HD rumble feature is going on in there. It's got the hookups. It comes with the little grip extenders. I just feel that there's just a lot going on in these little controllers. And they have to communicate with each other wirelessly. And they have to be able to, you know, hook up in a lot of different ways. There's a lot of buttons on them. I don't know. It just feels like there's a lot going on with them. It's not just a controller like a normal video game controller. That is just a series of buttons, each of which has to send a a single message to the system here or there. Maybe some that, like, have, you know, a few extra little doodads. This is, like, four different types of controller all meshed together. Right, and let, let's take a let's take a moment here to look at uh, the prices of each of these things. So the Nintendo Switch Pro controller is about sixty nine bucks. The Joy Con pairs are seventy nine bucks, and the Joy Cons left and right by themselves are fifty bucks. If we look at the Xbox One controller MSRP, that is sixty bucks as well. And the PS4 controller, MSRP, is also 60 bucks. So this price isn't far off from market standard. Yeah, and you know, it's, this is what I was saying about, like, these stories that make it sound like they're excessively overpriced. Like, this is, yeah, pretty much what controllers cost, but there's a lot more to them than a regular controller. Yeah, exactly. And if you think about it, buying a different colored Joy-Con controller is kind of like buying a different color for your Switch. The The Switch colorization is from the controllers themselves. So if you bought a gray Switch, the, it comes with gray Joy-Cons. If you wanted a blue Switch, you don't have to buy an entirely new Switch. You can just buy the blue Joy-Con controllers. And that works as a different color scheme for, for your handheld. The only price I have an eyebrow raised about was the switch dock the dock being ninety dollars is definitely a lot pricier than i was hoping and that i expected i, I was expecting to be in the forty dollar range honestly i was hoping yeah. it would just be a simple little dock 
that didn't have much going on. Right. I think that's that's completely fair, and um, I, I agree with you there. I yeah. I can't. I and I can't. I cannot answer why that is that price. I will try to look into that. But yeah, there might be more hardware in there than we are really aware of right now. That is. It does have the fan. That's the only thing we I, yeah. I know of that's in there. For, for for us, we don't really. There isn't really a precedent for pricing something like a dock. <laughs> that's true. That there's, is very true. There's. There's precedent for controller and pro controller pricing, so we don't really know what's involved with this dock yet. Yeah. I'm not going to defend the ninety eighty nine dollar price, but uh, I'm I I need to learn right, more. Right, right, right. But but just perusing through but just perusing through GameStop, I mean, all the system controllers are in like the sixty to seventy dollar range, so that that seems perfectly in line with Reason. them there. So yeah. I think it's not unreasonable to expect. Yeah. All right. I think we've gone on pretty long here. So thank you, everybody, who sent us questions. And I'm I'm sorry I couldn't answer every single one of them. But you all gave us a very good selection to choose from. And we had to address the ones we could address. Yep. And it, it, please keep sending us uh, questions and emails. We're, we're always going to look at the questions that you guys have and we might even address the ones that we missed today so yeah i've definitely bookmarked uh, like one or two of them because i'm going to want to talk about fire on them forever so uh yeah <laughs> <laughs> and i i have a bunch of questions that i have on my plate that we i want to address in future episodes too yes. and in fact we there might be episodes dedicated to just answering questions so that's not that's not a bad idea we, we might have to yeah that's something that. we can do all right well anyway thank you everybody for listening if you do like this show, there is a myriad ways that you can show your love and support. Please consider visiting us at patreon.com slash the switchcast and pledging your support to let us know we're over halfway to our first goal and we would love it to get over the hump and really solidify the deal there. Um, there's you know 10,000 of you listening. I'd love to see at least a couple of new patrons uh, giving us a hand before the next episode goes up. Of course, if you also want to help us out, another good way is to go to iTunes, leave us a review, and help more people find us that way. And you can just join our communities over at the SwitchCast on Twitter and our Facebook group. Uh, all the links to everything there is in the show notes. And you know, special thanks to Essa for this awesome music that you've been listening to this show. <laughs> and uh, as always... Until next time, everybody, switch it up.